Hello Grade 12s, today's lesson is about human reproduction and it follows the Grade 12 Life Science CAP syllabus. And as always, all of the topics here in the, in the department's guidelines are mentioned in the PowerPoints. Okay, so we get to the introduction. So we start here with sexual reproduction, a haploid male gametes, all gametes are haploid, so this is a bit redundant, but just so that you get the concept, a haploid male gamete fuses with a haploid female gametes. So that's fertilization, when a haploid male gametes fuses with a haploid female gamete. And this forms a single diploid cell called a zygote. And now this one single diploid cell undergoes mitosis. So it divides, divides, divides by mitosis to form genetically identical cells because mitosis forms identical cells, meiosis not. Okay? And then these cells, so now there are millions of identical cells. Some of them become differentiated to become um, arm tissue, some become differentiated to become muscle tissue, so they become differentiated for different purposes and they do this by undergoing chemical and physical processes so that they can perform different functions. Now this zygote divides, it becomes, the cells become differentiated and a baby is formed. This baby is then born and it grows up and when it reaches puberty it reaches sexual maturity and then in this person's sex organs meiosis takes place. And when meiosis takes place, it makes gametes. And gametes are haploid cells. They have half the number. Haploid plus haploid is half plus half to give you one, one diploid cell. And in that way, meiosis neutralizes the doubling effects of, no, of fertilization. Because if you had a diploid cell and a diploid cell, you'd have more than just 46 chromosomes. Okay. Because a haploid human cell has 23 and then it's plus 23 to give you 46, okay? And then these gametes are genetically different from each other, and they are formed, and then this process takes place. This person then grows up, and when they have children, sexual reproduction takes place, and the cycle continues. Then we get to the structure of the male reproductive system. I'm going to start on the outside and work inward. So we start here by the scrotum. And the scrotum is a sac-like structure. It's like a little bag that protects and holds the testes. The testes is this part here in the middle. And it occurs outside of the abdominal cavity at 2 to 3 degrees Celsius lower than body temperature. And why this happens is because there are enzymes on the sperm cells in the testes. And these enzymes can denature if they are at a too high temperature. So the scrotum hangs outside the abdominal cavity so that it can be slightly cooler so that the enzymes do not denature. Then we get to the testis. The testes produce spermatozoa, which is the proper word for sperm cells, and testosterone, which is the male sex hormone. And that is why the testes are the male sex organs. But the penis is the male reproductive organ. Okay. So if they ask you what is a male sex organ, you say testes. If they ask you what is a male reproductive organ, you say the penis. Then we get here to the epididymis. And that is where spermata mature, spermatozoa mature. So it's where the sperm cells mature and they are stored there temporarily. And then we get to the vas deferens, which carries the sperm cells all the way here to the ejaculatory ducts. And the ejaculatory ducts, which are this, it's this part here, this is now 2D, there's another one on the other side. And it's, um, the ejaculatory ducts join the urethra just after it has left the bladder. So here's the bladder. Now you can see the urethra leaves it and the ejacul ejaculatory ducts join the urethra just after it has left, um, left the bladder. And the contraction of the ducts causes semen to pass through the urethra. Then we get to the urethra. It transports semen and urine out of the body, yeah, through the penis, but never at the same time. Then we get to the penis, which I said earlier, it's the reproductive male organ. And it transfers sperm from male to female during sexual intercourse. Then we get to three glands. One, two, three. The seminal vessel, I always think spiky because it has little spikes there, you can see. S spiky, seminal, seminal vessel, spiky, okay. And it's a gland that produces a fluid with nutrients which provide energy for the sperm. These functions of the glands you must know because they can ask you to name each of the glands and their specific functions. Let me get to the prostate gland. And it secretes alkaline fluid that neutralizes acids produced in the vagina, and then we get to the carpus gland, and it secretes mucus that helps with the motility, so the movement of sperm cells. Then this is a more in-depth rotor of the testes. So again, we start on the outside. We have the scrotum, 
here, and then the vast difference over here, the epididymis here, and then inside here we have seminiferous tubules. It's these little outward projections like that, okay? And each of the seminiferous tubules are lined by germinal epithelium cells that produce spermatozoa. So yeah, you can see the seminiferous tubules. And yeah, it has the germinal epithelium that's lining the seminiferous tubules. And then it has these squiggly ones that project inwards. Those are called Sertoli cells. Then these little dots over here are spermatids. And yeah, sperm cells. So the spermatids are made by the germinal epithelium. They mature into sperm cells. Okay. And then in between the seminiferous tubules, you have interstitial cells of Leydig. And the function of the Sertoli cells, they are rich in glycogen, which provides nutrients for the spermatids to mature into um, mature sperm cells. Then the germinal epithelium that lines the seminiferous tubules produces spermatozoa by the process of spermatogenesis. And then the interstitial cells of Leydig, these ones in between here, occur between the seminiferous tubules and secrete testosterone. Then we get the functions of testosterone. So this is now in the testes, remember, and we said the testes are the male sex organ because they produce the male sex hormone, which is testosterone. And the functions of testosterone is it allows for the development of the male secondary um, sexual characteristics. And this includes, so now you must be able to include or describe what um, changes happen. So they start growing a beard, they start growing pubic hair, the voice deepens, they get a more muscular body, and men's um, shoulders broaden during puberty. And then it also stimulates the maturation of sperm cells. Then we get to the structure of the female reproductive system. So I'm going to start on the left here and go around like that. So we have the ovaries, which are these two little, um, like, blobs here, they look like circular blobs, and they produce ova and secrete estrogen and progesterone. And these two hormones are the female sex hormones, which makes the ovaries the female sex organ. Okay, then we get the oviducts, or the fallopian tubes, and this connects the ovaries to the uterus. And the upper parts of the oviducts are expanded into ciliated funnels, so it's like a little hand that partially encloses the ovaries. Oh, uh, yeah, that word's missing there. Partially encloses the ovaries. And it transports over from the ovaries to the uterus. And then inside the oviducts, inside the fallopian tube, that is where fertilization takes place. So the egg cell moves up here, and then the sperm cells swim up here, and the sperm cell meets the egg cell here in the fallopian tubes, or oviducts. Then we get to the uterus. It is a pear-shaped, hollow, um, muscular wall structure. Okay. And this is where, in the endometrium, is where the embryo implants. So we get to that. Now the lining of the uterus is the endometrium, and it is richly supplied with blood vessels. It is the place where the embryo implants and the placenta form. So if this egg cell is fertilized by a sperm cell, it moves down here yeah, and implants into the endometrium. And then the cervix, this part here, yeah, it is a lower narrow part of the uterus which closes during pregnancy. Then we get to the vagina, which is the female sex, um, no, sorry, the female reproductive organ. The ovaries are the female sex organs. And it receives the penis and semen during sexual intercourse. Then let's quickly look at these two hormones. So they are responsible for an increase in the size of breasts, development of pubic hair, onset of menstruation, and widening of hips. So you must um, be able to describe what's happening to these things. You can't say, when a female reaches sexual maturity, she gets breasts, pubic hair, you must say it is the increase in the size of breasts, development of pubic hair, the onset of menstruation, and the widening of hips. You must be specific with that. Then we get to puberty. So puberty is when sexual maturity is reached, and that's usually, be, usually between the ages of 11 and 15. And in females, this is just more specific, 10 or 11 to 15, 17 years, and males 11 or 12 to 16 or 17 years. And then this is just a comparison what's happening in males and, what, and what's happening in females. So in males, sexual maturity is stimulated by testosterone, whereas in females, it is stimulated by estrogen. And then it causes the growth of male sex organs, in females, the growth of female sex organs, the start of the production of spermatozoa, the start of the menstrual cycle, and the production of ova. 
then growth of pubic hair, facial hair, and body hair. And then he adds the growth of pubic hair and development of muscles and deepening of voice, growth and development of breasts and widening of hips. So that's just showing what's happening in puberty in males and females. <clears throat> Sorry. Then we get to gametogenesis. Gametogenesis is the process in which gametes are made. So we have a different process for sperm cells and a different process for ova. Okay, so spermatogenesis. It's the process by which spermatozoa are produced from the germinal epithelium of the seminiferous tubules. So yeah, we said he has the germinal epithelium and yeah, is a seminiferous tubule. Okay, and then the germinal epithelium produce sperm by meiosis. The germinal epithelium is diploid, which means it has 22 pairs of autosomes and then an X and a Y chromosome because men or males have an XY chromosome. Females have XX chromosomes. Okay, then spermatozoa will be haploid and contain either an X or a Y chromosome because when meiosis takes place, this one diploid cell splits. So now each cell that is formed gets um, 22 pairs of chromosomes and either an X or either a Y. Okay, so here's the process of spermatogenesis. This first sentence is the easiest mark ever. If they ask you for the process of spermatogenesis, you always say it happens under the influence of testosterone. Then the diploid germinal epithelium in the seminiferous tubules, you must say the sentence, undergoes meiosis. Two marks here. So one, two, three. Four haploid spermatids are produced, another mark, and each spermatid matures, in, matures to form a spermatozoan. Another mark. So that's one, two, three, four, five marks. Very easy marks. And this is also, you must also be able to draw a sperm cell, a diagram of a sperm cell, and be able to label it. And this, this diagram here yeah, doesn't have a heading, but you must always have a title for your diagram or your drawing. Okay. So here we have the head part, the middle section, and then the tail. And in the head, there are two parts. There's the acrosome and the nucleus. The acrosome contains enzymes which digest the wall of the egg cell for fertilization. So that makes it possible for the sperm cell to penetrate through the wall of the egg cell or the ovum. And then the other part of the head is the nucleus, which contains 23 chromosomes. So the genetic information from the male. And that's the nucleus goes through into the egg cell. So only the nucleus goes into the egg cell and fertilizes the egg cell, not the whole sperm cell. So the acrosome penetrates the, the wall and then the nucleus moves through. Then we get the middle section and the middle section has mitochondria. And we know mitochondria allow for energy to be made. And this provides energy to the sperm cell to swim. And then it also has a tail used for swimming. Okay. Then we get to oogenesis, which is the process by which ova are produced from the germinal epithelium of the ovaries. So the germinal epithelium of the ovary produces follicles by mitosis. So now this is a bit different to how it happens in males. First, the germinal epithelium of the ovary produces follicles by mitosis. And then the follicles undergo meiosis. Whereas in the males, the germinal epithelium went straight to meiosis. But there's an extra step in orogenesis where the germinal epithelium first produces follicles by mitosis. And then these follicles undergo meiosis. So an ovum is produced by meiosis from a cell in a follicle and is and the ovum is then released every 28 days, which is called ovulation. There are 22 single autosomes and an X chromosome in each ovum. So 22 chromosomes and then an X chromosome to make 23 in a normal ovum. Okay, Because all females have XX chromosomes, which means all of the ova will have an X chromosome. But in males, because they have an X and a Y chromosome, the sperm cells will either have an X or they will either have, an, have a Y chromosome. Okay, then we get to the process of orogenesis. And I'm actually going to look here because this is straight from a memo. So, under the influence of FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, also a super easy mark, the diploid germinal epithelium cells in the ovary undergo mitosis to form numerous follicles. One of these follicles enlarges and undergoes meiosis. Of the four cells produced, only one survives to form the haploid ovum. So we know meiosis produces four cells. And of these four cells, 
three die, one survives to form a haploid ovum. Whereas in males, all four cells live. That's why males have a lot more um, sperm cells than women do have ova. Okay. Then we get to the structure and function of an ovum. So there's the haploid nucleus. So this is the structure. It also needs a title. Which fuses with the sperm cell, the sperm's nucleus, to form a diploid zygote. Then there's the jelly layer, which protects the ovum and makes the ovum impenetrable. So it cannot be penetrated once fertilize, fertilization has occurred. So once the sperm cell gets there, no more other sperm cells can penetrate it because the jelly layer makes the ovum impenetrable. And then there's the cytoplasm, which provides nourishment to the um, ovum. And yeah, it says in the memo, you must be able to draw the ovum with labels. So yeah, is the diagram you draw. Then we get to the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle is made up of the ovarian cycle, and it's also made up of the uterine cycle. And I don't know why I made this like a flow chart. It's a cycle, so I actually should have made it in a circle, but you'll understand. So it starts with the pituitary gland, which is a gland in your brain, and that produces follicle-stimulating hormone, which is FSH. And the follicle becomes mature, which is called a graphian follicle. And this graphian follicle then contains an ovum. The, so once a follicle contains an ovum, it is called a graphian follicle, and that is when it's mature. The graphian follicle produces estrogen, which is the female sex hormone, and this makes the endometrium more vascular. So now we must remember the endometrium is the lining of the uterus. It makes the endometrium more vascular. Then we get, yeah, every four weeks, so every 28 days, <clears throat> a graphian follicle releases an ovum, which is called ovulation. So ovulation is when, <clears throat> sorry, when the graphian follicle releases an ovum. Then the ovum is collected by the ciliated funnels of the oviduct. Then we get luteinizing hormone, which is also produced by the pituitary gland. So I think of follicle-stimulating hormone and estrogen as buddies. And then we get luteinizing hormone and later progesterone, which are buddies. Okay. So the follicle-stimulating hormone allows for the graphian follicle to occur. The graphian follicle produces estrogen. But yeah, once ovulation has taken place, luteinizing hormone is produced by the pituitary gland and converts the ruptured gra graphian follicle, which has now, it's ruptured because it has released the ovum, into a corpus luteum, so luteum luteinizing hormone. It converts the graphian follicle into a corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum secretes progesterone. So follicle simulating hormone allows for the graphian follicles to be formed, which secretes estrogen. Luteinizing hormone allows for the corpus luteum to be formed by converting the rupture graphian follicle into a corpus luteum. And this corpus luteum then secretes progesterone. And progest progesterone's function is to maintain pregnancy. And if pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum then degenerates, it becomes smaller, it disintegrates, and progesterone secretion drops. And then the unfertilized ovum passes down the oviduct, or the fallopian tube, into the uterus and leaves the body. Okay. Then we get to the uterine cycle. The uterus prepares for the attachment of fertilized ovum. And how does the uterus prepare for this? Estrogen that is secreted by the graphian follicle makes the endometrium thicker, more vascular, and more glandular. So these three things are needed for the endometrium to be um, fully prepared for the attachment of a fertilized ovum. So a zygote, but actually by the time it gets to the uterus, which we'll see later on in the slideshow, it is called an, an embryo. Okay. And then progesterone secreted by the corpus luteum ensures that the embryo, yeah, we see, remains attached to the uterine lining. So this is what happens to the ovum if it's fertilized or unfertilized. If the ovum is fertilized, the corpus luteum continues secreting progesterone and the embryo remains attached to the endometrium. If the ovum is unfertilized, the corpus luteum degenerates, progesterone secretion drops, and that allows for menstruation to occur which means the endometrium is shed from the uterus. Menstruation is between four to five days long. Sometimes it's longer, it's seven days, or even maybe eight days. It happens 14 days after fertilize. Oh, that is wrong. Sorry, this is wrong. It happens 14 days after ovulation, not fertilization, ovulation. 28 day, it's a 28-day cycle. The endometrium of the uterus comes off and is shed, 
and it is it happens usually between the ages of 11 and 14 that's when it starts and it only stops and that's called menopause and that's between the ages of 45 and 55 so menstruation starts between 11 and 14 years sometimes later and then it stops usually between the ages of 45 and 55 and menopause is when the body stops releasing over then this is just a summary of the menstrual cycle. So here it shows you what's happening in the ovaries and what's happening in the uterus between days 1 and 7. Days 8 and 13, days 14, 15 to 22, 23 to 28. So I'm just going to highlight some stuff. Yeah, the menstruation is occurring because the endometrium is being shed. At day 14, at day 14, the graphene follicle bursts, so ovulation is taking place. And then the um, lining of the uterus just becomes more and it becomes thicker and then if the, if it's not fertilized it sheds if it is fertilized it remains intact the embryo implants and progesterone carries on being secreted by the corpus luteum here we see what's happening by the pituitary gland what's happening by the growth of the follicle the um the ovarian hormone levels and the thickness of the uterine lining. So I'm going to look at this diagram more in depth than the previous one. You can read through the previous one. It sums everything up very well. So here we see FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, spikes as well as luteinizing hormone spikes. Here by day 14, which is, we can see the ovary is being released. I mean, the ovum is being released from the graphian follicle. And because luteinizing hormone is higher, than the FSH. We know that luteinizing hormone is what makes ovulation take place. It allows for ovulation to take place. That spike in luteinizing hormone tells the graphene follicle to release the ovum. FSH is higher, higher than luteinizing hormone because it's allowing the graphene follicle to develop into a mature graphene follicle. And then the ovarian hormone levels. So estrogen is Hi here. Why? Because the graphene follicle is secreting estrogen the more mature it gets. So it's increasing, increasing, increasing. And here by ovulation, it starts decreasing because now there's luteinizing hormone, which converts this rupture graphene follicle into a corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum makes progesterone. So now the progesterone levels increase. And then here by the endometrium, you can see between day zero to seven, there's menstruation, the lining is being shed, and then it becomes thicker, 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 all the way because estrogen makes it thicker and the progesterone also makes it thicker. But now you can see they're going to ask you, has the um, has the ovum been, been fertilized or not? And you have to use this diagram to explain if it has or if it hasn't. So we can see now that it has not been fertilized because the corpus luteum degenerates and progesterone levels decrease. Okay, so let's quickly look at <laughs> goodness. Let's quickly look at the role of estrogen in maintaining pregnancy. So it makes the endometrium thicker, more vascular, and more glandular. And then the role of progesterone in maintaining pre pregnancy it inhibits FSH. So if progesterone levels carry on going up, so let's say the ovum is fertilized and these progesterone levels keep increasing then FSH will not be produced. So um, high levels of progesterone inhibit FSH, which makes ovulate, I mean, which makes menstruation not take place. And that way it ensures that the embryo remains attached to the uterine lining, and it also makes sure that the uterine lining remains attached to the uterus. Otherwise, menstruation is going to occur if progesterone levels aren't high. Then we get to the developments. Of the zygote into a blastocyst and this happens just after fertilization. So we need to know two terms here. Copulation is when the penis is placed inside the vagina and spermatozoa are released and then fertilization is when the male gamete fuses with a female gamete to form a zygote. So this is just a summary. The sperm plus the ovum makes a zygote. The zygote divides by mitosis to form a ball of cells called the marilla. <coughs> so yes, fertilization it divides to make the marilla, then it divides more to form a hollow ball of cells called the blastocyst. The blastocyst divides more to form the embryo, and by the time the embryo reaches the uterus, it implants into the, into the endometrium, and then it divides more and more 
to make a fetus by 12 weeks, between 8 to 12 weeks. Okay. Then implantation, gestation, and the role of the placenta. Another two terms we must know. Implantation is the process by which the developing embryo becomes attached to the endometrium of the uterus. And gestation, it's a gestational period, is the period during which the embryo develops into the uterus, it develops in the uterus of the mother up to the time the baby is born. So gestation is basically just a fancy word for pregnancy. If your question refers to gestation, you use the word gestation. If your question refers to the word pregnancy, then in your answer you use pregnancy. And human's gestation period is about 280 days. Then implantation, gestation, and the role of the placenta. When the embryo embed, embeds in the endometrium, it forms two membranes around itself, and these are called the extra embryonic membranes. And like in the previous chapter, it also has a chorion and an amnion, similar to the amniotic egg. So there's the chorion on the outside, which forms chorionic villi, and they embed into the uterine tissue to make up the placenta. And you must know the placenta's functions. It has four of them. It attaches the embryo to the mother, an easy one. Then it allows for the diffusion of, dis of dissolved nutrients and oxygen from the mother to the fetus and the diffusion of nitrogenous waste and carbon dioxide from the fetus to the mother. So this fetus does not eat anything. It only gets nutrients in the blood from the mother. And it does this by the placenta. There's a diffusion of dissolved nutrients and oxygen from the mother to the fetus because the fetus cannot breathe either. It does not have its own functioning respiratory system yet. So it gets oxygen and nutrients from the mother and then it makes its own waste from the nutrients and its own carbon dioxide and then it must diffuse back into the mother's bloodstream so that the mother can get rid of it. And it also secretes its own progesterone at 12 weeks. So the placenta attaches the embryo to the mother, diffusion of dissolved nutrients and oxygen from the mother to the fetus, diffusion of nitrogenous waste and carbon dioxide from the fetus to the mother, and secretes its own progesterone at 12 weeks. And we know progesterone helps to maintain pregnancy. Then we get the amnion, which is on the inside. The amniotic cavity is filled with amniotic fluid, and the fluid's functions, you must also know. It protects the fetus from temperature fluctuations, it prevents dehydration, it allows for movement or growth, and it protects the fetus from mechanical injury by acting as a shock absorber. So it allows the, it protects the fetus because it, it has shock, it's, it acts like a shock absorber. So if the mother is bumped or something, the fetus is then not hurt. Then we get the umbilical cord, and it is a hollow rope-like tube that attaches the baby to the placenta. It contains, so yeah, we know the placenta from the chorion. It attaches the baby to the placenta, which is attached to the mother through the embedding of the chorionic villi in the uterine wall. Okay, so it's a rope-like tube that attaches the baby to the placenta, and it contains the umbilical vein and the umbilical artery. And now this is from the perspective of the baby, because we, are, we were always taught that artery means away and vein means towards. So this is now from the perspective of the fetus. The artery carries nitrogenous waste from the fetus to the mother. So it carries the nitrogenous waste away from the baby and the umbilical vein carries dissolved nutrients from the mother to the fetus. So the, umbil the umbilical vein carries towards the fetus. Okay. And then just contraceptives. You get surgical methods, physical methods, and chemical methods. Surgical methods is a vasectomy and a hysterectomy. Vasectomy is when they cut or they tie the um, vas deferens. And then the hysterectomy is when they cut or tie the fallopian tubes. An IUD is an intrauterine device, which is like a little T shape that funnels the fertilized ovum out of the uterus and make sure that it can't embed into the uterine tissue. Then physical methods of condom, you get male and female condoms, you get diaphragms, cervical caps, and then chemical contraceptive, contraceptive pills, you also get contraceptive inject, injections, and then spermicides. Okay, so that is the human reproduction, everything, yeah, everything of the human reproduction chapter.